Hello, everyone, and welcome to you all. Happy New Year. Just about. It is December 30th, the anti-penultimate day of the year, and this means that we have to wrap up some loose ends before we can head into 2023, and one of them is a biggie. We have to sift through 365 days. Well, I guess, what, 363 days, but we hope there's not going to be a big bombshell CBC first-person story about the racism of power tools or whatever you can never in the next out, two though. days. You never know. Yeah, <laughs> but we have to zip through almost 365 days of fake news and find the very best that are befitting of the annual Fake News Awards, which has become very much a favorite of ours here at True North and also a favorite of those of you watching this show, as we know, because the Academy of Fake News is a democratic institution. We don't just decide this as some autocratic Emergencies Act-esque uh, dictatorship. No, what we do is... Uh, put it out to the people to decide what the best of our fake news stories of the year are. We have a top 10 list and we are going to do the countdown right up till number one. And our number one fake news story this year actually is something I'm not going to tell you until we get there because that's how a countdown works. So, oh my goodness, I just did real-time clickbait. Anyway, I'm Andrew Lawton, joined as always by Harrison Faulkner, and we have a doozy to get us started here. What was number 10 this year, Harrison? So we talked about this just a couple weeks ago. This was a mask. This was an article written by a mask. Get it, Andrew? You see what they're trying to do there, right? Very clever stuff. Very, I mean, this, this, just the height of journalism. Pulitzer-worthy quality writing here. So it's written by a mask to talk about some, you know, talk about the, the love lost between the mask and its partner, that being us. Very cringeworthy stuff. I mean, just to read you a quick, uh, quick uh, excerpt from the article, it starts off with this, Andrew. It's me, your mask. I'm here in between the cushions of your couch, or maybe I'm under the bed. It's difficult to tell. It's so dark. I just want to know what happened. Where did our love go? So there you can see, this is from the Ottawa Citizen. Uh, they, they, they tried to, they tried to get their, uh, they get their fake news story up the ranks. They come in at number 10. So all things considered with the number of fake news you have to deal with Andrew this year, number 10 is not bad for the Ottawa citizen. Yeah, and I mean, having been around uh, some people in the last few weeks since this article was written, I don't think many people read or at least heeded uh, Mr. <laughs> or Mrs. A. Mask's work because there still is a, a fair bit of masklessness out there. But, you know, so it's just like a Heather Tough Mallet times. column, really. You can write it, but no one actually reads it or listens to it. Uh, let's move along to number nine here, which is a bit of a big one and one I suspect will escalate a little bit into 2023. Uh, journalists uh, raising issues with me mean tweets. Now, the Canadian Association of Journalists has done this campaign. Uh, they, they've talked about how there's a, quote, coordinated campaign of hate against female journalists, mostly, quote, of color. The president of the CAJ said to CTV News, this is an organized campaign to threaten and intimidate journalists into silence and undermine the freedom of the press in Canada. And this was, of course, written about uh, by some of those journalists, evidently, from CTV News. Now, when we talked about this in the past, I, I said, I don't want to diminish the nastiness that is leveled towards some journalists on Twitter. I see it directed at some. I also see it directed at me. There is just in general a fair bit of nastiness on Twitter directed to anyone who sticks their neck out for anything, whether it's in politics and media, and I don't think it's right. But I also don't think this victim complex has really been doing anyone any favors because you've got some people that just say, I'm going to ignore it, I'm going to block it, I'm going to move on. And then you get other people that seem to really revel in it and that only fuels it because people see they're getting a reaction that doesn't make it right but it's just what happens well no exactly and this is just so transparent it's all about trying to demonize the convoy it's another level of demonizing the freedom convoy yeah we can say mean tweets are bad nasty things online are not great no one wants no one wants to do that no one wants to see that but when the caj who like i said they purport to stand up for uh, journalists but they rarely ever stand up for independent journalists they're only really there for mainstream journalists but the CAJ says that from the Freedom Convoy, it's a coordinated campaign of hate, specifically targeting female journalists of color. I mean, this is just another recycled version of Freedom Convoy bad, the rest good. This is just another classic example of what they're trying to do, Andrew. And I think a lot of Canadians see right through it. No wonder it got, uh, it got its way on our top 10 list. 
Yeah, number nine, not uh, not exactly winning, but still in the running, still a, a nominee and f- a finalist on the shortlist, so to speak. And uh, as I said, though, I, I think this story is not yet over. I think there's probably going to be another uh, similar version of this in the 2023 list. So all I can say to people is to stay tuned. Uh, number eight, I know it's your turn, but can I do this one? Oh, no, I was going to give I was going to give the floor to you. So, Andrew, it's all okay. yours. Go, go ahead with it. <laughs> So I, I am the, I forget the name actually for someone, there's like a, an ologist or whatever for someone who does crosswords, which I should know because that sounds like the type of thing that would be in a crossword. But uh, this is a one that is near and dear to my heart as the token crossword doer of True North. Crossword puzzles, CBC says, are not inclusive enough. Crossword puzzles are everywhere, but how inclusive are the bylines and the clues? Okay, so CBC's, issue here in the author's perspective is that too many white people are making crosswords and the clues themselves even are only representing straight white men. So uh, if you look at a crossword, you're not going to find anything about anything that's not white. So when you look in and it tells you, uh, oh, you know, one across is a... uh, uh, you know, an alternative to butter that's margarine, that's actually not inclusive. Or when, you know, four down is uh, saying actor Tom Blank uh, and you put in Cruz, well, that actually is uh, just a cis-normative, heteronormative, white supremacist trope because Tom Cruise is a straight white male actor and this is all you get. So you need to do like, uh, you know, Marvel movie Blank Panther, uh, which has been in crosswords, actually. So I don't know how we can say they're not inclusive enough. It's just, if you're looking for something, you're going to find it here. Uh, but this one was like going after crossword puzzles and the people that do them and the people that write them. And then, like, just you fast forward a few weeks later, and there was this controversy where the New York Times crossword on the first day of Hanukkah had this design on your screen there, which looks a lot like a swastika. So maybe this CBC article article was on to something. You know, when you read this, this, so this is our eighth place story and the seventh place story coming up after it, Andrew. You read these two stories and you think to yourself, now not even the Babylon Bee would come up with this. Or, <laughs> or when they saw the headlines in the CBC, when they saw the headline in the next story, they must have thought to themselves, wow, we really have to step up our game, guys, because, I mean, reality is, is, sort, of, is sort of picking up and, and taking over parody at this point. Crosswords aren't diverse enough. The people who design the crosswords aren't diverse enough. I mean, where do you come up with this stuff? It truly is, could only be the product of the CBC. Just incredible stuff. I mean, that, 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 that I'm surprised it only came in at eighth place, Andrew. I thought maybe this one was going to make a bit of a run uh, closer to the top of the charts. But hey, I mean, like I said, I said this before with the last story. We're talking about top 10 examples of fake news in Canada throughout 2022. There are there are probably a hundred examples of fake news, so you got to think to yourself to make it in the top ten. This is the this is the upper echelons. This is sort of the the elite level of fake journalism, fake news in this country. So again, eighth place, not bad. Yeah, this isn't a recap of every story. This is only the top 10. Remember, we do probably three or four stories a week, 52 weeks of the year. Maybe we skip a couple for holidays. So there were like 150 stories at a minimum that we had to go through here. And it's only the the creme to the, the creme of the, the creme. I was going to say the creme of the crop. I was going to do a mixed metaphor thing. The creme de la creme, the cream of the crop, the, uh, the cat's pajamas out of the cat's. No, the cat's meow. See, I'm mixing metaphors left, right, and center. I'm about to secure the number four spot on the list or something. Uh, So let's move on from crosswords, although with the swastika one of the New York Times, I will say crosswords are on notice. You guys can't pull any of this nonsense anymore, or I'll have to eat a bit of crow. There we go. I got a metaphor right. Uh, Let's go on to number seven. What do we have? Well, for number seven, we are going to the Washington Post. We're we're kind of expanding our borders here. But this story, I have to say, it did get picked up in the CBC, so it kind of counts. Shark Week, Andrew, that famous Discovery Channel programming during Shark Week where I guess you watch a lot of TV about sharks. No kidding? Could you guess that the problem with Shark Week, Andrew, is not that there's, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not biodiverse enough. We're not talking about only sharks. No, no. It's the fact that the people are too white. There's too many men named Mike and it's too focused on, on what is it? It's too negative about sharks. Truly incredible stuff. For, so, so the Washington Post deployed a team of researchers, as they usually do. They're not busy doing journalism. So they deployed a team of journalists 
to uncover a startling revelation that apparently in Shark Week, this Discovery Channel program, there's too many white guys named Mike who talk about marine biology. And no kidding, the, 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 the description of sharks is too negative. We have to try to paint these sharks, Andrew, as, 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 you know, lovely creatures of the sea, you know, things you could go swimming with and things you could, you know, have a, have a fun little, have a fun little swim beside, not like they'll eat you in the ocean if, uh, if you look like good food. Again, this, this, just like the crossword puzzle story, is truly better than what Babylon B could come up with. It is better than Babylon B, Onion, whatever. Insert parody account here. It's better than that. It's, it is unbelievable stuff. Again, seventh place, pretty solid showing for the Washington Post. Yeah, I mean, I remember we did a little thing a few weeks ago where I tried to get one of those AI chatbot generator things to generate a fake news story, and I had it give me a column in the style of the Toronto Star about why power tools are racist. That was the, the reference at the beginning of the show. And then at a certain point, I'm like, I don't think I could have come up with a prompt bizarre enough to meet the reality of this whole story about Shark Week not being diverse enough. Because I was thinking, like, what's something I, what's some absurd juxtaposition I could frame to get a made-up call about something being racist? And I wouldn't have even thought, you know, shark work is not diverse. I wouldn't have even thought of that. So at a certain point, the reality is more ridiculous than what could pass as satire or even like AI nonsense. So uh, the, and the whole thing about the guys named Mike is a bit of an amusing observation, but they're trying to say, is there enough representation? My question is, is the representation of marine biologists an accurate reflection of the marine biology community? Because if the marine biology community is overwhelmingly white and male, then any sampling of marine biologists you interview is also going to be. But that's not a journalism problem. That's not a media problem. That's just the facts of biology and marine biology in particular. Well, we all know, Andrew, that that sort of diversity, the diversity that is accurate, of a particular group is not really what we're going for these days. It's not really, it's not really in fashion in 2022, is it? It won't be in 2023. It's all about trying to, you know, apply diversity standards that aren't representative to all of these different areas. One thing I did find funny about this Shark Week story was that the story about Shark Week being too white, the study, was headed by a woman named Lisa Whitenack which I just had a little, I thought was, that, was a little, that was a little amusing to me, given that, you know, we're talking too negatively about great white sharks. We're talking too, we're, we're, we're promoting too many mics, too many white guys. Okay, Lisa Whitenack, thanks for that uh, wonderful piece of scientific research. Yeah, if they put her in a crossword, that would not be diverse enough. But uh, that is the number seven entry. We move along to number six. Now, we're getting into some heavier terrain here. Uh, but as we've noticed in the last few years, everything there is possibly going to be in journalism has to have a COVID angle or a vaccine angle in some way. It just seems to be the way of the world, the way that researchers are taking their uh, cues. And this particular one from the Washington Post, regular exercise may improve the effectiveness of coronavirus vaccines. They talked about the fact that exercisers who were vaccinated were 25% less likely to be hospitalized with COVID than sedentary people who received the same vaccine. But the studies didn't look at whether active people gain additional benefits from their coronavirus shots and boosters. So it was the epitome of the media taking a correlation that even the researchers were not saying was causation, which is like you know, university level 101 here about correlation doesn't equal causation. But evidently, the Washington Post didn't get that memo. I mean, I don't think they were really looking for that, of course. What they were trying to do is find a way to promote the shot uh, and, and, and do whatever they could to, to make that the case. Oh, who could have guessed, Andrew, that that exercise, whether you're whether you have the shot or not, actually is better for you. It's like okay, we really needed a Washington Post article to try and spin it about the shot to come to the conclusion that exercise is good and being sedentary is not. I mean, this is just classic example of, uh, of, of journalists digging and reaching. It's when there's two, it's when there's like the, 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 the impetus on them to write X number of articles a day uh, becomes sort of the reality for them. They go, oh, we have to come up with a story tonight. Or otherwise, <laughs> we haven't reached our quota for stories. So My deadline's quickly... at six and I haven't done anything yet. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> We've we got to quickly put something together and whip it up. So we find this study and find a way to make our editors very proud by making it an angle about the shot. I mean, it's just classic, classic, 
uh, Legacy Media and Washington Post getting in twice on the top 10 list for Fake News Friday. I mean, goodness gracious, that deserves a round of applause for them alone. Well, we haven't even gotten to the top half now. We are at the midway point through the top 10 list. Who knows who lurks on the other side of it here, but we do go to global for number five. So the Washington Post gets a, a bit of a reprieve here. Uh, Harrison, this was a, a big one in your wheelhouse. Take oh, it away. Yeah. So, you know, Truth and Reconciliation Day, the first day, the first first year we had it, it was Trudeau's National Surfing Day vacation. So that was sort of setting the tone for how we should all feel about Truth and Reconciliation Day. This year, however, we got an even more somber, reflective opportunity when Global News highlighted drag artists called Indigi Queer drag artists to celebrate Truth and Reconciliation Day. Just in case any of us were, you know, feeling like we, 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 didn't, we didn't get the most out of it last year when our Prime Minister went surfing, this year we know we got the most out of it. We know we had the most reflective and somber day when Indigi Queer drag artists Ella Lamoureux and Rez Daddy did their uh, drag queen dancing for Truth and Reconciliation Day. Uh, just incredible stuff. No real, no real sort of journalism going on here from Global News to say, wait a second, how does this exactly uh, benefit uh, those who are survivors, those who are have been impacted by residential schools? No, no, it, w it wasn't about that. It was just sort of, hey, how can we tack on the message? How can we tack on the 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 sort of the woke message du jour to this Truth and Reconciliation Day? Oh, I know the best way to do it. Let's combine drag queens and let's combine Truth and Reconciliation Day. I'm sure no one was offended by that performance. Just an absolutely ridiculous thing for Global News to write. And no criticism, no criticism either, Andrew. No one said, hey, wait, how does this sort of, how does this advance Truth and Reconciliation? Does it, does it do anything at all to advance it? Or does it actually just sort of mock it and make it look ridiculous? Again, what a surprise. Didn't come from Global, none, none of those questions came from Global News, but the journalism itself did. That's why they're on the list. Yeah, when Justin Trudeau on the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation went out surfing in Tofino, one of the uh, big criticisms was that it wasn't spent in somber reflection and he wasn't talking to Indigenous leaders. And I, But again, I also don't think that going to an Indigiqueer drag show would have constituted somber reflection or talking to Indigenous leaders. I mean, in one sense, yes, it's, it's members of the community, but I don't see how this helps anyone atone for residential schools when they see res dad and Ella Lamaru grinding on stage. I, again, I could be wrong. I haven't read the TRC report in a while, but I don't think that helps us with reconciliation. No, exactly. It might have been tacked onto the back of the report. It might have been one of the last recommendations. You know, you got to throw in a couple of, of Res Daddy uh, uh, drag queen shows, but I didn't catch that as well, Andrew. And it's just another example, like you said, like, how do we take this, how do we take this, this idea that I think was sort of created in, in, with, with good intentions in mind to have a day where Canada can actually reflect on things that did go horribly wrong. How do we take that and just completely denigrate it? You go, you go surfing on the first day and then you put up these sort of, these sort of bizarre, very strange, weird performances the next day, the next year. It's, it's embarrassing, it's sad, and I think they've really sort of set the bar very low for well, what's going what's gonna to be, hopefully, something that I think keeps going on, but it's just ridiculous. You know, one thing I noticed, we have not had a lot of, actually, we haven't had any Trudeau content, really, on the list so far. I guess all of the voters thought that he deserved to be in the upper echelons of the top 10 list, because we are now down to number four. So we're getting to the final three here, getting to the, the big fake news story of the year. And number four is a story that is a bit worldly in nature. You may remember when Justin Trudeau went to Her Majesty the Queen's funeral in London. London, he decided that it was an opportunity for a bit of his own uh, form of entertainment. And yes, by the way, that is real life. That's not fantasy.
That is what we're caught in, and I'd rather be in a landslide. That was uh, Justin Trudeau singing the Queen song, although other Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody, well, in the bar of the Savoy, I believe it was, in London, and doing this well, spending rid- ridiculous amounts of money, we learned, uh, on this overseas funeral trip for the Canadian delegation. And it was an award-winning pianist on the piano. Great, that doesn't change the fact that it was a time and place situation, and this was mocked around the world by the press, especially in Britain, but the Canadian media took a very different view of these things. And there were a few examples here. Global just reported it and played it a bit straight, but they fact-checked the person who quoted it oddly and started trying to correct, well, it wasn't this hotel and it, you know, it was not in D minor. It was like, it was just ridiculous sort of stuff. Um, But then the best one was CP24, which said PM Trudeau sings Queen's class classic ballad, Bohemian Rhapsody, in tribute to late Queen Elizabeth II. So they said that this was actually done for the Queen, which even Justin Trudeau didn't say. So uh, some of the media were actually out there doing their own spin just to soften the blow of this global embarrassment. I mean, it takes it takes a lot of of courage, I think, to be, to be, that, to be that person in the CP24 and think to yourself, Oh, how are we going to do this? I'm just going to throw in that little in tribute line and we're just going to get away with this. I'm sure that there were lots of applause, lots of uh, lots of thanks coming from the Trudeau team when that article came out. But even the CTV article on this, classic, right, Andrew? It's a, it's a total sort of sound barrier from the Canadian legacy media to the rest of the world. The rest of the world just mocking him for it. I'm pretty sure CNN had stories that were negative. I mean, even, even lefty outlets around the world in the UK and in the US were mocking him for this because look it wasn't just as you saw in the video it wasn't just Trudeau singing it was Trudeau very dramatically very flamboyantly getting into his Freddie Mercury persona and belting it out after a long night sitting by the piano uh, but even the CT, even CTV tried to do this long form article about how you know do world leaders have the right to sing or party? How how come Justin Trudeau can't sing a little bit? And then they compared it to to Stephen Harper singing a Beatles song with Yo Yo Ma in 2009. Um, again, I'm pretty sure one was intentional, one was on a stage, the other was when he was sitting by a piano when he was supposed to be at the Queen's funeral. I mean, it's just classic, right? They'll go well, to no, any now, way. in fairness, he, he did go to the funeral. This was in the after hours show, but I, right? I certainly agree the whole trip was about the funeral. Right, the whole trip was about the funeral. It was not supposed to be Justin Trudeau's great Freddie Mercury moment, right? But it, it ended up basically becoming that. And, and we're supposed to sort of say, oh, a, a political marketing expert Clive Veroni says, Trudeau singing in London was blown out of proportion. Well, I wonder why people thought that. I wonder why people thought that it might have been maybe not the best look for Canada. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and this, the, it was a team effort as well, by the way. It was CP24 at the tribute, but they all get a little, they all get a little in on the action here. CTV, CP24, congratulations. I don't think CP24 gets a lot of recognition these days, Andrew. So, you know, for them, getting number fourth, that's a, that's a pretty good deal for them. Congratulations to CP24. And this brings us to the top three. Now, these are some of the heavy hitters. And remember, I go back to the beginning. This was a list that was compiled by you, True North Insiders, who had the chance to vote and get your favorite fake news stories of 2022 up to the top. And we are now in the final three. And we've got some heavier content here. But number three is a bit interesting because this is more of a general category because if we were to like break down every individual story in this category, I think it would probably be the entire list here as evidenced by the fact that it did make it to the top three. Uh, but what do we have in third place, Harrison? We have Polyev derangement syndrome. And of course, it had to be on this list. I mean, what a, what a, what a great year of journalists just completely melting down, embracing their own little CNN, MSNBC reaction to Trump for their own for their own uh, opportunity to kind of turn that into their own reaction to Polyev, so they broke out the they broke out the Polyev derangement syndrome. And I mean, again, like I said, we we could have a whole top ten list of best examples of this. But why don't we just go through the list? I mean, we had op eds and columns in the Globe and Mail talking about the dangerous rage, Andrew, from Polyev's leadership campaign. The dangerous rage Polyev is is channeling, or as another Globe and Mail op ed wrote the corrosive campaign. I mean, truly breaking out the, uh, 
go, going in with all the synonyms for how you can try and write, you know, bad, right? They, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to take Orange Man bad and turn it into Pierre Paulier. They did their absolute best. So we, got, we had Dangerous Rage, we had Corrosive Campaign, two Globe Mail op-ed headlines, embarrassing stuff. But then also we had what I thought was the best example of Paulier derangement syndrome was when Global News, uh, Rachel Gilmore was a journalist, when they took the picture, the, the, the handshake between Jeremy McKenzie and Pierre Polyev, and they took it as some sort of grand endorsement of the far right, the radical far right, because someone in the Diagonal, the meme country, by the way, took a picture with Pierre Polyev, who unknowingly took the picture with him. And then that was basically the news cycle for a whole week. Uh, so there was that, there was the, the, the handshake. There was also the meltdown of the Anglo-Saxon language, Andrew. I mean, where do you start? It's just a whole, a whole collection of, 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 of fake news examples that really deserve their entire show unto themselves. Yeah, and when, when Pierre Polyev used the term Anglo-Saxon words, what he was talking about was that we need to use, uh, politicians and governments need to use simple, clear language in legislation and in general so the Canadians know what's being discussed. So the fact that that was taken, plucked out of like a 90-minute interview with Jordan Peterson and held up as something offensive is absurd. I think my favorite is the MGTOW uh, controversy, which was like this hidden meta tag that was in YouTube videos that uh, apparently were got there and no one knows and this was a dog whistle to the far right or to the incels or whatever and the hilarious thing was Global did a report about this and in the hashtags they included the hashtag MGTOW which was the exact hashtag that they were uh, taking aim at Pierre Polyev for and again it's it's really this perspective of if you are looking for something you will find it and, and the media already decided this guy's far all right. So every step he took, especially early on, they had to filter through that. But I think the best one might be this one from Pierre Polyev's first media briefing as leader of the Conservatives. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, appreciate your presence here today. Uh, before I begin, let me just say that. Uh, uh, they, thank, thank you very much. Am I being? I'm being heckled here by 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 the by. Thank you very much for your congratulation. Thank you very much for your questions. I'm going to begin my remarks now. Justin Trudeau is out of touch, and Canadians are out of money. The cost of mo government is driving up the cost of living. A half a trillion dollars of inflationary deficits have bid up the cost of the goods we buy and the, and the interest that Canadians pay the cost for workers and businesses to produce the goods that we buy. On top of that, Trudeau proposes yet more spending to bid up costs Trudeau even further. The more, things the more he today? spends, the more things cost. It is just inflation. Their homes and to buy a home in the very first place. I'll put my hand up. The reason that... The, I look. Hand and so I mean, we, we, we have we we have uh, basically a, a liberal heckler who snuck in here today. I'm a liberal to, heckler. Well, I'm the chief political correspondent right. of that organization. Are you going to let you me make my remember statement? me from the guy who actually reported yeah. first on the prime minister breaking the law? Yeah. Are you going to We'd let me make like my statement? just like to ask a question. Say yes. I've so never, I've actually person. never seen you heckling the prime I've never minister. Ask Minister I've never Baird, seen you back heckling in the, day. the prime minister. Look. Bottom line is this. I'm going to take some questions at the end of this statement. Yes, I'm taking, I'll be taking two questions at the very end. I'll Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The, uh, so I'm going to start my statement again. Yeah, he wasn't going to take questions. Then he said he would take some questions. And then one journalist, David Aiken, decided to use his question to demand more questions. And as a result, just proved exactly why uh, Pierre Polyev might not have had the most friendly relationship with journalists. So do you think 2023 will bring more of the same? What one hundred percent, absolutely, and I just want to make it clear. You know, we have, we have, we're, we're going to give out our, our top three: a bronze medal, silver medal, gold medal. We'll give a little trophy for number one. But you know, there's so many great examples of Pierre uh, Polyev derangement syndrome. But I think if we have to give it to one outlet in particular, because to me that's sort of how we should do it. One outlet should get to uh, get to take home the award. It's got to go to Global News, right? They spearheaded the MGTOW thing, the MGTOW. They, you know, David Aiken, the uh, the Global News chief Ottawa correspondent or whatever his title is. 
Uh, it's got to go. It's got to go to Global News. Rachel Gilmore with the with the Jeremy McKenzie diagonal reporting. I mean, they really did spearhead Paulie of Durango syndrome. They put the team on their back, and for that, they are the rightful owners of the 2022 third place bronze medal Fake News Friday Awards. I mean, congratulations to Global News. Which brings us to second place, and I think still very much along that same vein of, of trying to see far-right boogeymen, or I guess that's a bit cis-normative, boogie people everywhere you go. Uh, and second place are the Freedom Convoy hate hoaxes. Now, this is a, a split award, as they say. There are two contenders in this category. Number one is the infamous arson host, and number two is the uh, less infamous, but I think still significant poster hoax. And the arson hoax, I think a lot of people know by now, it was jumped on by members of parliament. It was jumped on by people in the media. It was jumped on by journalists and activists that someone in the convoy supposedly tried to lock people in their apartment building and set fire to it. Now, someone did do this, but it was a person that had nothing to do with the convoy whatsoever. No connection, was known to police, uh, had some mental health issues, I believe, but literally zero connection to the convoy at all. But this story has been adopted and fueled by people who have never apologized for getting it wrong. And it still remains, if you talk to some people that haven't followed the corrections, where they think that, yeah, the Freedom Convoy tried to commit an arson on a downtown Ottawa apartment building. And again, it's that old line about how quickly a lie travels around the world while the truth is putting its pants on. Well, exactly. This is the entire, this is the entire strategy, right? Journalists have lost a lot of their credibility. I'm talking particularly, of course, about legacy media journalists. And one of the things that they do, this is a time old tradition, but it's specifically, it was specifically weaponized during the Freedom Convoy, Andrew, which is basically to write a story. And if you get it wrong, you can quietly change it. You can quietly edit the article without letting anybody know that you've edited the article, but you can write the story. And as long as it gets published, for about a day, as long as it gets picked up by a politician and then repeated in the House of Commons, then it becomes the reality, it becomes the truth. And that is how so much of this was driven. This is how so much of the negative reporting about the Freedom Convoy, which turned out to be mostly false, was driven. It was just by basically j journalists rushing to put out news, rushing to put out an article, not having the facts to back it up, but hey, we're just gonna get it out there. And by the time it's out there, by the time it's been out there for about less than a day, 12 hours. As long, as long as it goes out on social media, a politician shares it, well, it becomes a, it becomes a truth. And that's that. There's nothing you can do to convince enough people because there's still a significant number of people in this country that take what the CBC, take what CTV, take what Global have to say at face value. If they read it, it must be true. And that's the problem. And these journalists know it and they weaponize that all the time. And the other part of this category stars uh, fan favorites, the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, does it not? It certainly does. So the, the, the head of the Anti-Hate Network, Bernie Farber, who has been, you know, uh, been receiving money from the taxpayer, been receiving money from the government to assist on uh, anti-hate legislation. Well, he took a photo or he posted a photo of an anti-Semitic flyer, which he says was found by a friend in Ottawa. And it took about an hour until John Kay, who came to the rescue here, he's a, he's a very, very uh, strong on Twitter, he's always on this stuff. He came to the rescue and he basically just did a reverse image search, very simple strategy, everyone can do it. Bernie Farber, however, didn't before posting this anti-Semitic flyer he supposedly found in Ottawa. John Kay took the poster, found out that actually the exact same picture with the exact same backdrop of the poster, and the poster of course, was also found at a Miami rally of some sort the month before. So could it be, Andrew, that the exact same poster with the exact same backdrop and the exact same angle was found at both the Freedom Convoy and Miami one month apart? Possibly, but it turns out that it was a complete falsehood. It was a complete hoax. Bernie Farber shared the poster accusing the Freedom Convoy of being anti-Semitic, when in reality, that was a fake poster that was not actually in, that was not actually in Ottawa. And it was used to, once again, bludgeon the Freedom Convoy over it. Politicians picked it up, shared it on social media, and just like that, by the way, they haven't taken it down. By the way, just like that, it, it becomes the truth. It becomes the truth. And that is exactly how this whole thing works. So two Freedom Convoy hate hoaxes coming in at number two, coming in in second place. 
which is a very formidable place. So, I, I mean, even though you had to share it with the uh, arson thing, uh, congratulations, Bernie Farber. I believe this is a debut appearance for the Canadian Anti-Hate Network on the Fake News Friday award. So uh, we wish them very well. Maybe next year they can crack number one. We'll see. But uh, this brings us to number one. Now, in some ways, I actually think this is a smaller story than some of the other ones on the list. But it's also, I think, a lot more symbolic because it involves CBC. It involves the liberals and it involves multiple layers. This is like the fake news inception here, where it's like fake news being used to justify other stuff, which is then reported in the news. For number one this year, I don't know if we have the drum roll sound effect, but liberals used fake CBC story to justify freezing bank accounts. You remember this happened in February when the Emergencies Act came into effect in response to the Freedom Convoy and the Liberals cite an analysis by CBC as part of their justification for freezing bank accounts. In a 14-page document tabled in the House of Commons, the government uh, found that there was no need to cite a departmental report, there was no RCMP intel, they cited a story from CBC, from three CBC reporters, and this was enough to freeze people's bank accounts. Like, can you get more Fake News Friday award-worthy than this? No, it's, it's, it's truly unbelievable. Anyone who reads the CBC knows that they, they try to co kind of coax their opinion articles in two, co in two sections. They have opinion where they allow just completely unhinged opinions to end up on the CBC front page. Never conservative, of course. But like they have crosswords the opinion are page. racist or whatever. Yeah, exactly. They have the opinion page, and then they have the analysis section, which also is opinion. It is the exact same thing as opinion, but the analysis falls under people who have a, a better opinion. Or as the CBC wants to say, <laughs> someone with a, of, of a higher standing in society gets to write an analysis piece. So yeah, basically... Well, journal the, the journalists are allowed to write analysis pieces. The CBC <laughs> journalist is not allowed to write an opinion call them, but they can write right. an analysis. Right, exactly. So, so really, what we're talking about here is this: is this is the liberals, the government, relying on a CBC opinion piece to justify freezing bank accounts to give to MPs to say, wait. So, so the MPs had to vote on the Emergencies Act. This is what MPs were given. They were given the the fourteen page document included the CBC opinion piece as justification, and yet the government was still carried in the Emergencies Act vote. It, it's it's. It's truly worthy of the winner. Again, maybe not the biggest fake news story, but again, like you said, it it just paints the image for you. It, it tells you all you need to know, Andrew, about this government, about the decisions that they made during the Freedom Convoy, the decisions they used to probably make one of their worst mistakes in government, a mistake that many of them will never live down. This will sort of ride on them. The decision to freeze bank accounts will ride on them forever, I think. It'll be their legacy. And to do so, they relied on a CBC opinion piece truly emblematic, I think, Andrew, of where we are right now, where the government is, sort of the, the capacity that our government has to justify their decisions. If they're relying on the CBC, well, I think we're, got, we're in for a pretty interesting 2023. Well, it is a fitting winner and a deserving winner, and we thank all those of you who are supporting True North and the Insiders Clubs who voted in this poll and perhaps even helped uh, run that story up to number one. But whether <laughs> it was the IndigiQueer uh, drag performance or the op-ed from a mask or even our top three, we thank and congratulate all of our contenders. Very well done. Very well done indeed. Uh, perhaps all of you can continue the fake news into 2023. This has been an absolutely fantastic year. I've enjoyed being able to uh, pinch hit for Candace Malcolm in Fake News Friday this year as well and who knows what the next year brings uh harrison faulkner happy new year to you happy new year to you andrew and happy new year to everyone who's watching thank you guys very much for helping us out and congratulations to the cbc